right, our last speaker of the night is talking about one of my favorite jerks of San Francisco history and the, I shit you not, pyramid scheme that he had. <laughs> Kelly, welcome to the stage. Hey, y'all. I'm Kelly Jensen, and I have to follow that amazing talk, so if anyone wants to shoot me now, I've lived a good life. <laughs> Not totally kidding. So let's just lighten this up again, and uh, to give you some background on this talk, we're going to have to talk about funeral monuments. So basically, people have been building funeral mon monuments for as long as there have been r important people with lots of money who died. Uh, the, great of the Great Pyramid at Giza is the oldest and best preserved of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and it was built as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu, or Cheops, if you're more into the ancient Greeks, and, you know, that's cool. Got no problem with that. The Taj Mahal was a tomb built for the beloved wife of a Mughal emperor who died giving birth to their 14th child, so I think that deserves a palace. I have no problem with that. <laughs> and the mausoleum is, in fact, named for King Mausolus, uh, whose tomb at Helicarnassus was one, another one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Uh, this is a Victorian riff on his tomb. This is at Highgate Cemetery in London. And the Victorians were super, super into mausoleums because... They had this whole thing about showing your status, about how fancy your tomb was, so like the bigger and the fancier the better. And a good local example of this is the Chocolate Baron Domingo Ghirardelli's mausoleum in Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland. I can hear we have some fans, so hey y'all, my people. Um, so this is good and fancy, uh, but it is nothing to what Ghirardelli's friend James Lick wanted to build for himself, which was a pyramid the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza in downtown San Francisco. <laughs> which begs the question, who the hell was James Lick? And how could he afford a fucking pyramid? So Lick was not California's first millionaire. That title goes to Sam Brannon, who's my favorite historic jerk, but he wasn't far behind. He and his full, lustrous neck beard <laughs> were originally from Pennsylvania, but he made a good chunk of money by moving to South America and making pianos, which I know we've all done. Um, so when he arrived in San Francisco in 1848, 11 days before gold was discovered in California, uh, he had a whole bunch of piano money burning a hole in his pocket, so he started buying up all the land he could get his hands on, which turned out to be an incredibly lucrative move uh, because he bought like the entire block of Montgomery between Post and Sutter for one ounce of gold dust. So by the, time uh, by the time San Francisco became, you know, San Francisco, uh, he owned a sizable chunk of it. And he also arrived in San Francisco with 600 pounds of chocolate, uh, which sold immediately like wildfire. So he convinced his chocolate-making neighbor from Lima, Peru, to come to San Francisco, which is how Domingo Ghirardelli got here and started his chocolate company and was able to afford his really nice mausoleum in Oakland chocolate money, bitches. <laughs> so Lick made a lot of money, and he owned a lot of land, but what he was mostly known for was being a smelly old jerk. He was completely unpleasant to pretty much everyone, and he almost never changed his one nasty, greasy suit, despite the fact that he was incredibly wealthy. He could have had lots of suits, but no, smelly, greasy suit. Neck beard. Neck beard. So I really can't improve on this contemporary description of him. Those who knew him declare him to have been miserly, irascible, selfish, solitary, and whose chief delight appeared to lie in the indulgence of the whims of a thorny and unfragrant old age. <laughs> His primary motivator in life was pretty much spite towards everybody. He built this lovely estate in Santa Clara, the Lick Mansion. I won't tell you what went on there. Uh, but one day, some young ladies were visiting his gardens, and one of them happened to mention that she had seen a nicer example of some plant or other at some different garden, and he said, oh, oh, in that case, you need to see my other flower garden. And so he marched them way out to the other end of his hot, dusty estate for, like, miles and miles, 
to a vacant lot full of flowering mustard weeds. And he was like, hey, look, it's my other flower garden. And then he snuck away and he left them to walk home by themselves. He also ordered the Conservatory of Flowers as a prefab kit, and he was planning to give it to the city of San Jose in thanks for all of the many, many things that the, San Ho the city of San Jose had done for him. But then he read an article in the San Jose newspaper that criticized his nasty, greasy suit. <laughs> and he was like, screw you, and he, for and he refused to give it to them. So after he died, it was found at his estate, and it was still in the original packing crates. So some rich guys from San Francisco bought it and gave it to the city. So that's how we got the, the Conservatory of Flowers, yay. We can have nice things, just this once. <laughs> Lick also cut his only son out of his will because he thought he didn't pay enough attention to his pet parrot. So, he was a delightful human, just a great guy, super relatable. Um, so when James Lick had a stroke at the age of 77, he decided that he would dispose of all of his money for the public good, mostly so that people would have to say nice things about him after he was dead, because they were definitely not saying them while he was alive. Like Neckbeard. They probably said that a lot, frankly. Um, he put up a bunch of random monuments in Civic Center and Golden Gate Park. The Pioneer Monument is one of his, and the Francis Scott Key Monument is one of his because everyone needs to remember the guy that wrote the Star Spangled Banner. Um, he also created the James Lick Baths, which were a free bathhouse for the poor. Personally, I think he had a hell of a nerve saying things like, tell them to wash and be clean, because he was a filthy, scruffy motherfucker. He's <laughs> a dirty man. But my personal favorite, I kid you not, is the Lick Old Lady's Home. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, in addition to making people say nice things about him, Lick also really wanted to be remembered. And he thought that the best way to do that was by building something huge and ridiculous and being buried in the base of it. And this brings us back to the pyramid. So, this enormous monument was planned to be more massive than the royal tomb at Giza. And it would have been built at the corner of 4th and Market. Uh, <laughs> which is where the Westfield Mall is now, and that's debatably a better use of the space, but you know. But fortunately or unfortunately for all of us, this is where George Davidson enters the picture. And Davidson was an astronomer and also the president of the California Academy of Sciences, which was, yes, thank you. Uh, it was the first research museum west of the Mississippi. And Davidson suggested James Lick that what California really needed more than a giant pyramid, <laughs> Uh, was, say, a really good astronomical observatory, uh, which we didn't have at that point. And this actually struck a chord with Lick because he had met one of California's first astronomers, George Madeira, back in 1860 and had invited him to his house and they'd done some stargazing. And before Madeira left, he had said, if I had your wealth, Mr. Lick, I would construct the largest telescope possible to construct. And apparently Lick had not forgotten that somewhat awkwardly phrased sentence. <laughs> so eventually, James Lake uh, agreed to give up his pyramid scheme and spend the money on a telescope superior to and more powerful than any telescope yet made, which I think tips him into supervillain territory. <laughs> but he decided that he would be buried under that instead. Which is why, if you go to the Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton today, you will notice that there's a dead guy buried under the base of it. <laughs> and there are always fresh flowers on his grave, per the terms of James Lick's will. Unfortunately, Lick died 12 years before the observatory was completed. And when it came time to dig up his body from the cemetery and move it to his permanent tomb under the telescope, George Davidson was one of the people who had to identify his presumably still unfragrant corpse <laughs> before reburying it with a nice note that said, yeah, that's James Lick, all right. <laughs> I definitely recognize the smell. 
But Davidson probably thought it was worth it because in addition to building the observatory, James Lick had also given the California Academy of Sciences a new home for their museum. And it was, ironically, the block of Fourth and Market where he had been planning to build the giant pyramid. And the Academy stayed on Market Street until everything burned down, of course, in the earthquake of 1906, after which it moved to its current home in Golden Gate Park. The Lick Observatory is still operating today. It has yielded some extremely cool uh, discoveries about the universe. Six of the moons of Jupiter were discovered there, including the first new one to be identified since Galileo's time. <laughs> so ultimately, James Lick's weird plan worked, even without the giant pyramid, because one, we all remember him now. And two, I really don't want to say nice things about that guy. I think he was awful and reportedly smelly. But even I have to recognize his contribution to science in creating the Lick Observatory and giving a home to California's first science museum. So I guess we're going to raise a glass to thorny and unfragrant James Lick. May we all follow his example and lick old ladies. Okay, so here's a fun one. I just got a low battery alert on the computer. I don't think it's plugged in. <laughs> it's fine. Here we go, we're gonna speed round this before this thing dies. So our next talk is systems and early bird tickets are gonna be available very soon. It's also open for curation, so you can pitch your own talks at Odslon Speaks. You can also find us in all of the usual places and the best place to find us is in our Something Weird group on Facebook where we're gonna put all of our reading lists and follow up links and all of that kind of thing. But before I leave the stage, I want to raise one more glass. And this toast is to the monumental things we have not done yet. May we be brave, may we be creative, may we think beyond ourselves, and may we achieve monumental good for generations to come. Thank you so much to our speakers, to our volunteers, to Steen, to our venue, to all of the staff, and thank you for coming out tonight. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>